Thank you very much this evening for, for being with us. Um, we are presenting a session on studying abroad while managing mental health concerns. And we have three study abroad alumni with us this evening. So um, maybe if, if each of you could um, introduce yourselves, um, provide your name, your pronouns, uh, your major graduation year, and when, where, when you studied abroad. And um, Rami, if you don't mind me, we will start with you. Hi, my name is Rami. I am a fourth year student at the University of South. I am studying environmental science. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I studied at Mahidon University in Thailand from September of 2019 to December of 2019. And Rebecca Jensen, do you wanna go ahead? Uh, sure, so I'm Rebecca. Um, one of the two it looks like. Um, and then I studied with the hotel restaurant tourism management program and then uh, double majored with property management as my secondary. I graduated in December of 16 and then I did a study abroad in the winter term that started in um, at the end of 2015 and went into 2016. And I studied over in Spain for the, um, it was the food and wine pairing uh, with Professor D'Souza. It was very fun. <laughs> Thank you. And Rebecca Palmer. Hi, I'm Rebecca Palmer. My pronouns are she, her, hers. My major is uh, professional communications and emerging media. My graduation year is uh, December 2020. And I went to the study abroad trip in Sweden in May of 2019. It was the arts and innovation with uh, Dr. Mary Space, and it was the two week long abroad study abroad program. Thank you. And Rebecca Palmer, I'm not sure if it's just my view or not, but I are you able to move up your camera a bit? I, I can't see your face. Can others see your face? I'm not sure. No, okay, there we go. Yeah, we can see you now. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm just going to go through uh, the questions. And um, so if maybe and maybe we could keep kind of the same um, same order uh, so we don't get too confused between Rebecca Jensen and Rebecca Palmer. <laughs> we'll go uh, Rami, Jensen, and Palmer. Um, and you don't have to answer all the questions if you don't wish. Um, we do have one hour, um, so just to kind of keep time in mind. Um, but could you please uh, share with us how did your mental health concerns play into your decision to study abroad in general and where you, know, where you chose to go and your pre-departure process? So I did not take into account my mental health disorder. I have a diagnosis of type two bipolar disorder. And so that was something I should have taken into account, but I did not. And I wish that I did. So all I can really say about the pre-departure process is that for future applicants and future people who study abroad, I hope that they take into account their disorder and the preparations that they will have to make in order to accommodate themselves, um, especially if anyone suffers from bipolar disorder, whether that be type one or type two, circadian rhythm is extremely important in the management of your manic, hypomanic and depressive episodes and traveling to a new time zone and living there as I did for four months was very hard to adjust to and people with bipolar disorder often have bouts of not sleeping for a week on end. And I experienced that the entire time that I was in Thailand. I would not sleep for a week then sleep for a few days, heavy, and then not sleep for a week again. And I was on my medication, but that is just something personally I'm opening up about because if people do suffer from bipolar disorder, which is a very specific diagnosis, it's very important to have full disclosure and transparency with your provider, whether that be your mental health counselor or your physician, because they can best help you make a management plan on how to alleviate any of the stressors that can happen from traveling, how to minimize entering an episode, whether that be manic or depressive. And so I didn't fully prepare and 
I just want others to learn from my experience of not preparing and hopefully they can fully prepare and better learn from my mistakes. Thank you. And uh, Rebecca Jensen, do, would you like to weigh in on, on the, the question? Sure. Um, so I have anxiety and depression and that was, um, I didn't, it didn't play too big of a role in my decision to go just because I, I really wanted to have that experience of going to another place because I didn't know if I would get, really get the chance for another several years. And nowadays, <laughs> you don't really know when we're going to again. Um, but uh, with my anxiety, it's very much like I, um, I really had to sit down and make the list and try not to because I, I overthink things <laughs> very far and it, um, it leads to with at least with like kind of in this instance, it was really making a list, making sure I had everything on the list in my suitcase and not overpacking for like every single thing that could happen. It was more of like, just go with what you need <laughs> and don't kind of try not to overthink everything of um, going into that. Great, thank you. And Rebecca Palmer? Uh my diagnosis as far as mental health is a uh, general anxiety disorder, moderate depression, and I also have post-traumatic stress disorder. So um, I on purpose chose the two week long because I had never traveled further than the United States or Canada before. Um, and I was very, I guess I also have, um, disabilities in uh, physical health as well. So I'm a post kidney transplant patient and um, I've had cancer before. So I'm in post cancer and all that is because my, my baseline is I live with a rare disease um, called cystinosis. So I, a lot of my anxiety and depression does come from living with a rare disease, but there's other factors besides being a disabled person that factors into my, specifically the PTSD. So I chose a shorter time just to see how I could handle things. And I know this might hit on some of your other questions, um, but the two week, that there was a two week option for study abroad was, um, I, I, I didn't think I could choose a shorter time than the four months. And I was really excited to see that last year there was a two week option because I was worried about medication and specifically as a rare a person with a, a disease that I can barely get my medication in the United States because only 500 people live with my disease in the States. I had no idea what that was gonna look like in Sweden. So I was able to figure out packing my medication, including my anti-anxiety and antidepressant medication. And I knew I would have enough for at least three weeks because my brain, again, with the anxiety, my brain went to, what if we're stuck there for an extra week? So I knew I would have a month's worth of medication. Um, and that aided in, in the packing and just the option that there was something shorter than four months was what I had in mind. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, that's definitely something to take into consideration. And I like how you planned for that extra week just in case as well. Um, so uh, who or what were your best resources for information and sources of support as you prepared to go abroad and then while you were abroad? Uh, for example, did you talk with a study abroad advisor or a mental health professional during your decision or preparation process? And while you were in country then, did you access any mental health resources in the host country? Pre-departure, I did speak with the study abroad advisors, not about my uh, mental health disorder. I did speak with my physician and my counselors about what they thought, and they thought it was not a good idea for me to travel abroad because my diagnosis was so recent at that time of having bipolar disorder. And previously I had been diagnosed with major depressive disorder and they found that that actually wasn't true. And so they felt that it was not a good time to leave, but I did anyways. But when I was in country, 
Um, I did establish care at Bangkok International Hospital while I lived in Thailand, and I had monthly checkups with a psychiatrist, and I took medication, quetiapine. It's an antipsychotic and sedative for people that have type 2 bipolar disorder. So I was medicated. I brought medication with me, but unlike Rebecca Palmer, I didn't have to worry about if there was going to be an availability of it because many people suffer from the condition that I have. So the resources and the medications were readily available to me whenever I needed them. And so monthly I would have a checkup, a sort of mental health examination to make sure that I was adjusting well, which I wasn't, but that was beside the issue. They needed to continue me on medication. And so I was able to access the correct resources that I needed. However, I will say there was not counseling offered at my university in Thailand, the way that we have the counseling center at UW Stout. And so I was, I had to shift from having weekly meetings with a counselor who knew me very well and knew my quote unquote triggers, knew what caused episodes. And as Rebecca Palmer stated, I also have been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. And so along with that are things that trigger that. And so it was very different to not have that same support group when I was abroad. I almost felt blindsided a bit, even though I knew it was going to happen I felt that I had to prepare myself in a way that I wasn't ready to. And I think all three of us can probably agree that with the diagnoses that we have, it is hard when something unexpected comes up and when you're not anticipating something. And so that was my biggest struggle. But I had the opportunity to establish care at a hospital and have full health care coverage and insurance through my provider and through my organization that I studied abroad with. So I was very fortunate in that way. And that is essentially the only tool that I had while abroad medically. Um, for me, it was more of um, talking with, because at the time I, I didn't really realize it was anxiety and depression until I had gotten into college. And so it was just a couple of years after I had figured out like that was what it, what was going on um, and had talked to a couple of people or like a couple of medical professionals about it, but I wasn't seeing a therapist or anything or counselor or anything like that at the time. Um, but a few of my friends knew what was going on. And so one of them was checking in with me like every day or every other day, making sure like I was doing okay over there. Um, so I never had to, um, I never had to seek out anyone in the host country. I was very lucky that way. <laughs> um, but yeah, overall, it was pretty much just kind of, it was kind of my own support group. It wasn't really uh, kind of professional support on that side. So over here in the U.S., I see a cognitive behavioral therapist, and I also see a psychiatrist. And um, because the rare disease and my kidney transplant and cancer all happened under age of 12, um, being like talking with uh, medical professionals and pharmacists, insurance and doctors is kind of like, it's like a lifestyle for me, like brushing my teeth and um, eating regularly and that kind of thing. My mental health diagnosis didn't happen until I was 16, and then I was uh, incorrectly diagnosed and got a better diagnosis when I was 24. Um, so when I talked to my cognitive behavioral therapist about my desire to do study abroad uh, when I was 30, is what I was uh, in my 30s last year, and she was like, I think it's a good idea because, you know, you've established what your triggers are and, and what, what you need to do to feel safe. And, you know, um, 
kind of your boundaries and that that kind of thing. And with that option of two weeks, she was okay with me going, as was my, um, specifically my kidney transplant doctors. And uh, they were the ones who were potentially, I needed to inform that I was going to another country. And I when I told them Sweden in 2019, that was okay. Um, as somebody with uh, immunocompromised being. So um, I kind of checked to see if the country had any organization for my specific rare disease, because sometimes rare diseases, they will, like family support groups will exist in other countries. And um, Sweden, unfortunately, did not. But when I got over there, because I knew the professor that was leading the two week one, we had actually connected um, outside of class in a local theater tap group. Um, I was comfortable telling her more detail about it. She So um, I did get like a fever over in Sweden and um, I decided to take, you know, as a transplant patient, I can't take um, the only over-the-counter medicines I can take are Tylenol and um, Benadryl. And uh, I took Benadryl or Tylenol and I was able to get better within 24 hours. I wasn't so keen on seeking out a clinic or hospital in Sweden because my case is so strange and a lot of doctors, even in the US, they'll kind of, instead of a person, they'll look at me like, oh, can I bring my med students in and can we look at you? Um, I was kind of afraid because being in Sweden, would they not let me leave the country after? So that kind of fear is probably, it would, it wouldn't, if somebody didn't have like this huge ultra rare background, it wouldn't be there. Um, but because I knew the professor and I probably should have done a better job of getting to know my peers that were going on the trip before we went on the trip. I mean, I met some amazing um, girls women, college women um, on the trip. And by the time we left, it was nice to have their support. But the first um, like beginning of the trip and things, it kind of was a little bumpy for me and I had to adjust in in that sense. Thank you for, for sharing your stories. And they're very inspiring and in how you really persevered um, in showing how it can be done, how study, study abroad can be done. Um, so thank you for sharing those stories. Um, can you uh, talk a bit about what were the cultural practices and views uh, towards mental health in your host country? And what was your experience as a result of those views? So the peers that I had made in my host country that were Thai, it was not common to speak about mental health. And I don't really think that it is that common in the United States of America to speak about it. I think that's something we are seeing more so on the forefront of our society in the past few years. But I was very used to keeping things kind of under wraps and, you know, pretend that everything's okay because you don't want to bother anyone else with your issues, even when your issues are real and people should know about them but you feel that it's a burden on other people or you feel that it's a burden almost more so just on yourself. So you don't even want to acknowledge it. And so Thai culture, because I lived in Thailand, they are very much in that strict kind of rigid, um, kind of occidental way of thinking where nothing is wrong. Everything can be fixed by working harder. Everything can be fixed by motivating yourself. You can always do something to fix what you are feeling. It, it was almost as if they didn't recognize that there are actual imbalances in the body and that people go through experiences, people's bodies develop different disorders, whether that be mental or physical. It almost seemed that they wanted to more so explain away things because they didn't want to acknowledge that there's these whole host of problems that need to be addressed at a societal level. And it's not just the people's fault that have the disorders. And so I knew one Thai person who opened up to me about, they also had have 
um, bipolar disorder type two. And so I was able to bond with someone in country. I know that that might sound odd, bonding over a disorder, but it actually is very comforting when you know someone else is going through the same thing that you are, even if it is something that you don't desire to go through. And everyone here, obviously we do not desire to go through what we have to go through. And we would take our diagnoses back if we could, I would assume. And I know that we all learn and grow from what we have. And that was very hard in a culture that didn't recognize the disorder that I had. And bipolar disorder is a very debilitating mental disorder. And it does impact all of my social interactions. It does impact my professional relationships. It does impact intimate relationships, friendships, everything. And so I was a bit saddened that I lived in a country where it didn't seem to be as accepted or acknowledged, even in the hospital setting that I was in. Um, not exactly what Rebecca Palmer was speaking about, about how her rare case is often used almost against her as like a case study, which is very inappropriate. And I apologize, you've experienced that. When I was in the Thai hospitals, being a transgender American woman with a mental disorder, it was almost like seemed comical to the psychiatrist that like this person with like 50 different weird things about them and foreigners in my office. And they almost didn't believe me when I was like trying to explain, you know, like, this is what I have. I need medication for this because I didn't bring the proper documentation proving that I had a diagnosis in the United States. I had medication prescription bottles proving that I was prescribed things, but so that was a hoop I had to jump through because they were very tight um, and anal about what they were going to prescribe to me. I had to essentially fight for my, my cause and myself. And I think that's hard because some people with their disorders, they just wouldn't, you know, if you suffer so much from anxiety or generalized anxiety disorder, you might back down because confrontation could be a trigger for your disorder. And it was hard for me to get what I needed to get. And so that was very, the, essentially to summarize what I'm saying, the culture was not as accepting with mental health disorders as the country that we all live in now. And that surprised me because I don't necessarily feel that where we live is the most accepting of it. I think we're doing better, but it was definitely different to go somewhere where the view was worse. There we go. Um, so for me, I was only in Spain for um, about two and a half weeks. Uh, so I'm not really sure how the full like Spanish culture really views it, but just kind of from what I had been reading before I went, it seemed like it wasn't too big of a deal, but I think that also would be dependent on like what cities you're in. And if it's like a bigger city, it might be kind of like even in the US where it's like, um, cause I live in Wisconsin. And so like, if you're in Madison, it's a lot different than if you're in Eau Claire or in like a very small town in anywhere random Wisconsin. So I think it, um, I think it definitely would depend on kind of where you were in the country. Um, and, and I was seeing somebody's question was like how to see, how to start seeing a therapist abroad versus here. Um, and I think that kind of depends also on like what country you're going to, if you're going to be close to a place where you would be able to, like if it's like close to a hospital or close to, um, close to a center that has like a therapist or counselor kind of stationed there. So I think that would depend on kind of where you're going um, if you're going abroad. And to add on to that, um, <clears throat> it, you know, our, our, we work with partners when you go overseas, whether that be a third party provider or um, a, you know, a partner university, we know um, most of these people. Um, we meeting a lot of them today um, and they you can always talk with them and they can help 
<clears throat> excuse me, provide that resource of where uh, you can go to seek out mental health uh, counseling. Rebecca Palmer, do you want to add on to that at all? To the question? Yes. So having only been in Sweden for two weeks, I really had no semblance of what the country offers as far as mental and emotional health services. Uh, I can say that from my observations, they even from the rural cities to the larger cities, there was not a lot of visibly disabled people like here in the States, whether you're in a small town or a large town, you'll see people using mobility devices like wheelchairs and canes or people um, like myself. I have a very kind of slower um, kind of limp gait sometime depending on how my body's feeling and I have a, a little bit of a posture thing due to muscle weakness and everything so a lot of their energy is they have a lot of green energy and they're very proud of that um, a lot of people use bicycles versus cars to get around and like their um, trains are run on recycling versus gasoline so it was a very mobile place as far as when we were going to small towns and larger towns but then I was thinking if somebody had significant disabilities like what's the accessibility for that and that wasn't a question I really got answered um, as far as mental and emotional health I was around um, I was one of the older ones in the group I'm I'm in my 30s and a lot of the students were between 18 to 22 and I opted to open up about my mental and emotional health to them and Granted, they're all American UW Stout students, but that seemed kind of unusual to them that I would open up about something like that. So even within like other American students, um, it was kind of like a learning opportunity for them to listen to me as like the person 12 years older than them, educating them on even if you look young and healthy, there's a whole internal world going on and you don't know what somebody could be going through. Yeah, I absolutely agree, Rebecca. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, for the next question, um, what tips do you have of what to do or what not to do to adjust when you get to the host country and to address your mental health on a continuing basis while abroad? Well, I think we all will have different answers because we all have different disorders and diagnoses, but with bipolar disorder it's a very serious disorder to be diagnosed with you have to be seen in the presence of a physician having a hypomanic or manic episode and so it's very hard to manage bipolar disorder and i won't sugarcoat that for any students that may have that disorder and want to study abroad or as Rebecca Palmer is saying, you know, you could not know if you have it, anything or what anyone else is going through based on how they look. And so I was able to partially manage it by having my medication that I have to take daily. When you have bipolar disorder, you have to take medication daily, usually morning and night. And it, they are very powerful medications. It is an antipsychotic, uh, very similar to what schizophrenic uh, patients would take and it is a sedative so you have to be careful when you take it because it will make you fall asleep and I have making the mis I've made the mistake multiple times of taking it in the morning and then being completely drowsy falling asleep wherever I am and so you have to know exactly the side effects of your medications and I think it's also really key that before going abroad while abroad and after coming back from being abroad, you need to be the number one person in charge of your mental health. You need to always be fighting for yourself. You need to always be aware of what's going on. Listen to your mind, listen to your body, especially. Um, I know that both Rebecca stated that they had done very short term studies and I did a semester, so an entire term. And so I really had to listen to my my health when it came to decisions that I made and 
with having bipolar disorder, um, you kind of like you want to stabilize your mood, but your mood is constantly like this and it's called rapid cycling and you can't chemically control the dopamine and serotonin that your body is regulating and it's incorrectly doing it. And so there are, beside the PTSD diagnosis that I have, there are triggers even for bipolar, um, which I was not made aware of until after I had come back to the States, but changing time zones is a very large trigger for people with bipolar disorder because routine and sleep schedule is so important to combating the disorder as best you can because it is a lifelong diagnosis. And no one told me that. And so I was not prepared at all for the changes that were going to happen mentally and physically when I was in this completely new environment. And I thought, oh, I'm taking my meds. I'm okay. But I think everyone that has a mental disorder knows taking your meds is only part of the fight and the battle that you have with yourself and um, of trying to improve. And so it was, I wish that I would have known some things more. And I think Rebecca Palmer touched a little bit on knowing your triggers is extremely important. And if you can gain that knowledge in any which way, shape or form, and sadly, most of the time you learn your triggers through them happening to you it's not like you can take a quiz online and, oh, this is my trigger. No, you usually have to go through the emotional pain of this, this triggers me. And it might be something you encounter often. And that's something, too, that I don't think should be glossed over um, by anyone that suffers from any sort of disorder. Because I think a lot of times I wasn't vocal always when I was abroad. And I wish I would have been. And I still wish I would be more so now about hey, this triggers me, like with my social circle or with, you know, who I'm interacting with, like, I can't have this around me, you know, this certain stimuli, or these words or these actions, these situations or like, you know, certain things, everyone has something that it's going to either, I don't really like this terminology, but I can't think of a better way to say it, but like set them off. And it kind of catalyzes then the whole reaction of what your diagnosis actually is in that disorder. And so I would say I, I did prepare with medication, but I really wish I would have better prepared with triggers and also being more vocal about what I suffer from and what my experience is, because we are all individualistic in our experiences and someone with the same disorder as each of us is still completely different than us. And so I think it's really important that we let, you know, everyone that we come into contact with, we don't have to go into detail, but, you know, when we're studying abroad, we are putting ourselves in a vulnerable situation mentally. All, you know, all three of us did. And so it's important that we best prepare ourselves. And I think, Rebecca Palmer, you said that you spoke to the professor. Um, that was a really good idea. I think that really was because you gave someone else the knowledge and the tools that they needed to step in just in case. And then speaking to the other Stout students too, you gave them the knowledge and the tools to be a peer and an aid to you in case something were to happen. And I didn't do that. And so anyone watching this or learning from this, I think that is a great thing that you did. And I'm very happy that you did that and happy that you talked about that because I never even thought about that. But that's all I have to say. I'm not even sure if I answered the question, so I apologize. No, you did, Rami, thank you. Uh, so a big thing for me was, cause I also have like just regular seasonal allergies, but then, um, so just kind of making sure I'd like, that was kind of a thing with my anxiety of like making sure I was taking, taking that on a certain schedule because I was um, I have to take stronger stuff now just because my body got so used to like everything over the counter and because you have to keep with that kind of medication like your body can get so used to it and it just basically stops working after a time so it's like basically once you kind of cycle through the over-the-counter stuff you kind of have to figure out what will work 
so at the time I was still taking something, I had to take something like four every four to six hours. And with my allergies, it was pretty much like almost four hours on the dot. Um, and so that was like a big thing with my anxiety of like making sure I was taking that. And I, I made sure to tell, cause I knew a few of the girls before I had gone. Um, and a few, a, a couple of them knew previously. And like, I also made sure to tell the professor before we went of like, like I need to take this like is this going to be an issue when we're doing our lectures and classes like if all of a sudden I have to like <laughs> take a pill while it's, like doing this and he's like no that's fine and so it was like multiple people knew and then I had confided in just a few of those girls as well of my anxiety and um, kind of part of the trip was also trying to like push my boundaries of my anxiety as well and certain triggers will pretty much make me shut down <laughs> and I can't really like think or like try and figure out a way out of it. And so, uh, I made sure at least a few girls knew that that might happen. And if it did basically just like, hopefully having them help me. And it did happen. I did have it happen like once when we were trying to find our way back to the hotel and I just kind of shut down. And so one of the girls was just like, grabbed my hand and like basically led me back with the rest of the group just to like make sure I was following them. And so that was a little, that was a little more intense of a reaction, but it was every now and again, that does happen. And so just kind of knowing what makes that happen is really like what you, what you were saying before of like knowing your triggers and like knowing what will what will set it off and like what what'll happen if if certain things um kind of all line up so I think yeah that's a very big thing of like making sure at least one or two other people on your trip know kind of you don't and like what the other Rebecca had said as well of like you don't have to go into the entire thing of it it's just as long as they know a basis of it um and to make sure you're safe as well. Uh, thank you both Rami and Rebecca with the C's. <laughs> um, I, yeah, telling, like not even, you don't have to do the whole, I tend to, um, because I've worked in a lot of speech advocacy for my specific rare disease um, and have done some classroom teaching myself, you know, talking and talking with like most of the people on my trip was almost natural for me. But like um, Rami was saying how everybody's individuals, um, you don't, you can even just grab like the Rebecca with the C said, um, just one or two other peers and um, you can just share kind of, and then you can like offer a reciprocal thing like, like you don't know if that other person might also be struggling with something and because you came up to them first they're like oh hey by the way since I'm looking out for you when I do this and it can be kind of like a I guess a buddy system of sorts um other tips I would have that I found helpful is so I I actually have a medic alert bracelet and I wasn't sure how that would translate over in Sweden but I always carry like a typed out list of the medication I'm on and when I had my diagnoses, and then um, my transplant center, they had a list of my doctors here in the US just in case there was something like emergency where I had to, um, like my, let's say my fever wouldn't have gone away in 24 hours. Um, I carry like the papers in my purse along with my passport. And then um, because flying on airplanes, uh, having the bottles with like the pharmacy and things is, you know, important and then crossing borders of other countries. Um, but others, I concur with everything um, the other two gals on this on this call said. Great, thank you. Those are some really great tips and, and takeaways from your experience. Um, for the next question, I know this might pertain more, more to Rami, perhaps, just because you were in country longer. Um, but can you tell me when you came back from your experience, what suggestions do you have for dealing with the often surprisingly challenging process of readjusting, or like we say, reverse culture shock? Rami, you're muted. Thank you. So I apologize. It was very hard for me. 
Um, also, before I answer that, I see that someone commented something in the chat and I just wanted to give my answer to that really quick. Um, I didn't experience any homesickness. So the other two participants in this chat might be able to better answer how to combat homesickness. Um, but they were also only gone for two weeks. So I guess if you feel homesick, try to maintain contact with your family and the peers that you have back home. That's the best way I can help you with that question. But then to answer your question, um, could you repeat it, please? Sorry. That's OK. Um, what if, when you came back, what suggestions do you have for dealing with the often surprisingly challenging process of readjusting? Thank you. I apologize. So I would say I had a pretty extreme readjustment process and I may be smiling, but it was very painful and it was only nine months ago. Um, I had a boyfriend while I lived abroad and that relationship ended very surprisingly to me. I ended up overdosing on my anxiety medication um, that I was taking because I was also binge drinking. And so I was in the hospital for the entire end of my time abroad. And then I had to fly back to the United States. I had to do three connecting flights to get back to MSP, Minneapolis, and then be picked up by my family. And I have such an odd familial situation with my choice to transition that I actually came back homeless. And so I had to directly move into a homeless shelter. And so my mental disorder was exacerbated beyond belief. And I did have my medications, but at, you know, I think I th possibly the other two participants might be able to agree to this as well. There are just times in your life where your medications are not gonna cut it and you just it feels like your world is imploding and so the readjustment process of coming back to the united states was extremely hard for me i left this world that i had become fully accustomed to and wanted to stay and i think that's almost the antithesis of the person asking about homesickness is it was the first time and i touched on this with um, in my earlier session um, about being an LGBTQIA identifying person is that it was the first time I could really be myself as a trans woman. And now living in the States, I've developed this sort of rapport to speak with people and be myself. And that was developed abroad. And so I felt like I was losing this humongous part of myself by coming back. I was losing all of these friends. I was losing the first real support system I felt that I actually had losing my relationship for reasons that were unknown to me and still are and coming back with essentially no familial relationship no friends they were all they were all studying university in different states and the uw stout community i came back during wind term and so there was no uw stout community and i was just in this really sort of period of flux of it was really hard and I I wish that I could say it wasn't so that everybody hoping to study abroad long term like I did thinks that it's rainbows and sunshine and when you come back it's going to be amazing and it might be if you have a great family if you have a great support system in the states it might be but maybe incorrectly I used studying abroad as an escape from my home and tried to make a new home and didn't want to fully admit that it would never be my permanent home. And so the readjustment of coming back was extremely hard. I would say that was the hardest part of everything for me was realizing that everything was over and that I had to come back. And I had some extreme situations, which I delineated to all of you. And I don't mean for those to sound commonplace because they're not. Um, I'm not a very practical and or common person so the situations that i went through are situations i hope no one else would go through and just by me speaking about these i hope that potential participants realize you know it will come to an end and 
prepare themselves for that. I never prepared myself for that readjustment period of coming back to the States. And to this day, nine months later, um, my partner knows who's in another room right now, my current partner. Um, every day still, it's hard for me to be back. And I think there are some things that you need to realize when you study abroad, it will change you in ways that you don't realize, especially when you do a long-term study. You might realize things about yourself that you can't satiate when you're back in the States. You might realize that you really like certain things about other places that you just can't get and you can't emulate here. So especially Wisconsin being so small, fairly sheltered. We have Madison and Milwaukee. We're close to Chicago and Minneapolis, but it's an entirely different environment when you're abroad. So I apologize for the lengthiness of my speech. That's all right. Um, Rebecca or Rebecca, did you want to add anything to that? I know your, your short, your experiences were a bit shorter. Um, did you have anything to add or? Um, just kind of for the homesickness and like readjusting. It was definitely a readjustment for me with the winter. And we got back on like, I think we got back on or flew back in on a Saturday and a few of us had carpooled back to Stout and then our classes started that following Monday. So it was pretty much like, you're back and you basically have to jump right into everything. So like you're still jet lagged, you're still trying to kind of figure out what's going on when you walk in. Um, they do tell you like for winter, um, our professor is really good about saying like, get all your classes set up, get everything ready to go. So that pretty much like he knew you have to get right back into it. Um, with the homesickness, I didn't really feel much homesickness just because I wasn't gone for very long. Um, so I think if you are worried about that, I would maybe opt for that shorter, um, shorter study abroad experience rather than a longer one. Um, I think that was, yeah, I'm trying to think if there was anything else, but um, yeah, just kind of getting it was definitely a little bit difficult getting back into everything because like for at least for most of the group that I went with, like they kept wanting to go out and explore everything, which like I also wanted to do. So then like getting back home and you wake up and you're not going out to explore like you're just on stout campus. It's a little hard to kind of readjust to that. It takes a, a week or two <laughs> to kind of get back into that. I wanted to respond to the question in the chat about um, homes, homesickness abroad. Um, I, I'm dating myself here, but I studied abroad before there was social media or email. Um, so I was completely isolated and I studied abroad for an academic year um, in, in Sevilla, Spain. And the homesickness was very difficult for me, um, especially since I did feel, you know, isolated and, you know, it was much more difficult to, I couldn't even use the phone in the house. I mean, I could take an incoming call, um, but I couldn't make any outgoing calls. I had to, you know, walk a couple blocks to the phone uh, or walk, go across the city to the telecabina. Um, but so times were very different then. Um, but some things that I try to keep in mind were, um, Sometimes I would think about what would I do on a normal, you know, Friday night back in the U.S. or a Saturday, you know, would I go to the movie theater um, and try to find some of those things you normally do, um, but also making friends. And in a lot of these situations, uh, you know, anytime you go abroad, especially like if it's a semester program, for example, um, even if it's a shorter program, somewhere in the process, you're going to have an orientation, um, especially, you know, you're going to have a pre-departure orientation with us or with a faculty leader if it's a shorter program. Um, but then when you get in country, you're going to have an orientation there. And it's usually pretty quick to meet friends because you're all in the same boat. Um, you're all a bit nervous. Um, everything's unfamiliar. And but until you get it's unfamiliar until you get used to it. Um, some of the best advice that my mom gave me before I departed um, for Spain was the simplest advice was just remember you're never lost. You're just in a place you've never been before. And it seems like common sense, but that really helped me. So there's times when I was lost. You know, I didn't have any Google maps or anything. Um, and I would just take some time, sit on a park bench um, and just calm myself down because you can easily, um, when you're lost and unfamiliar, it's easy to 
panic. Um, and I would just take some time to really figure out where I was. I would pretend, you know, sit on the park bench and pretend that like, I was waiting for someone. And meanwhile, I was trying to figure out what, where the heck I was. Um, and, but I tried to stay busy with, with friends. I made Spanish friends. I eventually had a boyfriend and that helped. Um, he was Spanish. Um, and so, you know, the longer you're abroad, typically the longer the, the homesickness may or the culture shock may may happen. Um, but one thing I've learned too, just um, from working in the international office and doing surveys from students when they re when they um, return, is one of the questions I ask in the survey is. Uh, about culture shock and how how was your culture shock? What was the level of it? And actually, I'm really surprised a lot of people. And actually, Rami, you had mentioned this, um, where you really didn't expect or you didn't you didn't really experience that culture shock. And I'm kind of wondering if I really, you know, there's the um, or maybe you said that when you when you when you returned, Rami, maybe I'm I'm misstated um, that, but. Um, I, I wonder if I, I can attribute it to technology. It's a lot easier to stay in contact with friends and family back here. Um, so, you know, I, if you want to go for a, abroad for a long period of time or a short time, I um, definitely so consider it. And there's, there's ways to um, get across or get beyond the culture shock. And then you have the time of your life. So <laughs> um, we have about, uh, six or seven minutes left. Um, and I do want to get to a couple of the other last questions. So maybe we can just take maybe a, a minute or so each to um, respond to the last questions. Um, but access to medication, supplies, or services can be an issue in some countries. Would anyone like to share their experience and any suggestions in this area? Uh, I didn't have any issues with access to my medications, and that was because I made sure with my insurance provider before going that I was going to have access, and they told me which hospital to go to and which doctor to see. So I think that is the biggest thing that someone could do if they're going long term, uh, similar to the situation that I did, and that's really all I can say about my experience. Um, I kind of had the same thing as what the other Rebecca was saying earlier of like making sure I had extra medication with me, um, just kind of pretty much everything that I needed. And I made sure all of them were labeled so that if for some reason, like coming back, I, it was no issue going to Spain, but I knew like coming back sometimes like with border patrol, like they get very antsy about stuff. And so I just made sure everything was labeled well and I didn't have any issues with that. Um, but yeah, overall, I, I didn't have any issue with that. Yes, um, it was, I'm probably, probably reiterating myself here, but I on purpose chose the two week. So I knew I would have at least a month's worth of my medicine because at least two out of the 10 prescriptions I take are medications that I have a hard time getting in the United States. And as far as like world medical health care and rare disease community, the United States is kind of where a lot of rare drugs are innovatively created. So if the United States citizens are having a hard time getting it, a lot of other countries either A, don't have it for their people with rare disease, or B, they do, but it's for people there in the country. So um, the two-week option, I just, I can't, I guess I can't say enough how accessible that was to a person who identifies disabled, um, especially with a rare disease that I also had the same opportunity as my peers to go abroad. Thank you, that's really helpful. Uh, for the last question, uh, looking back on your experience, what is your biggest takeaway? And do you have any final suggestions for students considering studying abroad while managing mental health concerns? I think that any student that is hoping to study abroad should probably have a very good grasp of their disorder and or diagnoses before going abroad. And I know that that isn't always 
something that is able to be done because sometimes you don't realize you have certain issues or triggers until they come about. But realizing and understanding yourself fully before leaving is a very good tool and resource for yourself because once you leave, you are gone until that duration that you predetermined is over. And so I wish that I would have been in a better mental state for my baseline before leaving. And that's the advice that I would give anyone that wants to go abroad is make sure you're right with yourself before leaving because in my situation, being somewhere for four months with a time zone difference that was exactly 12 hours. So when it was midnight in Bangkok, it was noon in Menominee, Wisconsin. And so there really was no communication between anyone in the States and myself. So I really was alone um, besides the group that I had created there. And so my mental health issues, I had to deal with on my own. And so, and I didn't fully deal with them when I should have been dealing with them before my pre-departure. And I think fully recognizing what you're going to go up against in your own head before leaving or with your own body is a very good thing to do because then you have that knowledge and that knowledge cannot be taken away from you. But if you don't have that knowledge, then you don't have the internal resources that you need to be able to even express things. If you don't know what's going on, then you can't tell someone else or ask for help always. So that would be my advice. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Kind of knowing, knowing at least most of what um, will kind of get to you and what um, you might, and again, you might not realize the full extent of what's going on with you. But as long as, I think as long as somebody else, either in your group, either the professor or if it's another student, just having at least one or two other people knowing at least your baseline of like, I have a mental disorder and I, I need help every now and again, like having at least somebody there or even somebody that you talk to every day, either on the phone or email or something, just kind of checking in with you and making sure you're doing okay. I think that's a very big thing, especially if you do one of the longer trips over just to make sure you're doing okay. Uh, all I really have to add, um, because I agree fully with both uh, Rebecca with the C and, and Rami, is um, in the age of technology, as Andrea pointed out, um, bringing your iPad or um, headphones for your cell phone, like if back here, music grounded you, make sure you have access to that in your host country. And then for myself, um, especially on the airplane rides and like if we had, for whatever reason, um, unexplained wait times in like the youth hostels or like, so like in Sweden, we had those trains that ran off of the cool recycling electricity. <laughs> um, I always, I had room for a small book in my bag and for me back home like holding on to something is a big deal for um especially when I start getting triggers in crowded places and um so a book and then um but also that's when you also have to make sure you have your your friend that like if you get lost in the book they're like hey group is going um but those were my two kind of outside of my medication that helped me stay grounded when I did kind of have moments of dissociation or things. So um, if you have something like tactile like that and you have room in your bags or in your purse, I would definitely suggest bringing that as well. Great. Thank you for sharing that information. And one thing I would add to is um, for stout students who want to study abroad is to um, talk with your study abroad advisors. If you feel comfortable, um, you know, asking questions or disclosing, you know, it's absolutely not required, but we want you to have the best experience as possible when you're overseas. And um, we can, you know, we may not have all the answers at hand, but we can provide resources or, you know, provide um 
some information about who you might be able to talk to or how you might be able to navigate a particular issue or question when you're abroad or, or you know, we can connect you to someone like our, our partners abroad. Um, so I definitely encourage students to reach out to study abroad advisors because um, we're, we're the ones who've, who've been through this process and um, want to help you and, and succeed. Um, our goal is always to have you succeed when you're abroad. Um, so um, well, I appreciate all your time today um, for joining the session. Uh, we thank you. I thank you very much uh, for doing this. I really appreciate it. And um, I'll close out the session and um, by turning off the recording in just a moment.